Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Assist Community Conversation. We're so excited that you're here today. Uh, we've been planning this event for several months, and we've really been looking forward to it. Before we get started today, I wanted to share a little bit uh, about ASSIST and who we support, what we do. Uh, ASSIST stands for the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. And so we exist to support people who've had spiritual, nonlinear, non-ordinary states of consciousness experiences in integrating those experiences and helping them receive the support that they need to be well and empowered through that process. So we have three populations that we serve. It may sound like we have two, the experiencers and then the helping professionals that help and empower them. But within that population of, of helpers, there's really two populations. We have uh, experiencers who are also mental health professionals and, and uh, helping professionals, other helping professionals like spiritual guidance counselors and life coaches. And then we have those helping professionals who have not had an experience, who are part of the population that we serve. So you can think of it as uh, concentric circles of these three populations. And in the middle, we support those populations through research, through education, support, training, and certification. We currently are running a training program uh, our third run of a training program for peer support facilitator uh, uh, training. And what we do there is we train spiritual experiencers to become the facilitator of their own support groups. And this has been a really incredible uh, experience and learning experience for us all and uh, really putting the research to work right in the hands of the experiencers themselves. So that's been really exciting development this year. We also have conferences for uh, helping professionals that I listed before. So anyone who considers themselves a therapist, uh, a researcher, spiritual guidance director, and life coach would, be, would benefit from coming to our conference in October uh, to get information firsthand from researchers themselves. And so, we're also working on the spiritual, uh, spiritual mentor program, which hopefully will be rolled out in later this year or 2019. So before I turn it over to our co-host and introduce Katrina Michelle, our new executive director, I wanna let you know that we are going to be introducing a few polls as we go along. And so right now I'm gonna pop up a poll and ask you, who are you? How do you identify within the three populations that we serve? And we'll leave that up uh, for you to look at and, and to answer here for about another five minutes or so. So right now, I'd like to introduce Katrina Michelle, our executive director. Katrina has uh, been involved with ASSIST from the very first conference. She's attended every single conference and presented as well, presented her own research. And in August, she came onto the board as the executive director. She practices as a holistic psychotherapist in New York City. Good afternoon, Katrina. Hi. <laughs> hey, it's really exciting that we're all here together. And I just want to thank our panelists for being part of this discussion. Um, it's really exciting to be bringing this conversation out into the mainstream. The conference is one way that we've been reaching people who are already involved to some extent. Uh, but I think you know, the initiative here is get people involved who maybe are not able to come to a conference for whatever reason. And let's have this conversation. Let's open things up. Let's all be heard. Let's get a better understanding of what the needs are and work to address it. That, that's what ASSIST was founded on, working to address the needs of experiencers. And um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about how to build trust with spiritual experiencers. So for those of us that are helping professionals, um, often the people we work with may be hesitant to share the truth of their experiences with us because we may come from a traditional medical model and there can be fear that um, they're going to be met. And um, as with every relationship, we know that trust is the foundation and we really want to be open and present hearing what a person's first-hand experience is and learn how to hold them in a way that's helpful. 
So um, I want to introduce our panelists today. And um, again, thanks for being here. Today we have uh, Dr. David Lukoff, uh, Dr. Rosie Kuhn, and Dr. Bradley Lewis. And um, I'd like for each one of you to spend about three minutes introducing yourselves. Um, what, you know, let us all know why you're deciding to take part in this today. And um, Dr. Lukoff, we could start with you. Okay. Uh, am I coming through loud and clear? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, it's an uh, honor to be uh, involved in this uh, assist work. Um, my work in this area dates back to the founding of the Spiritual Emergency Network um, in terms of uh, an organization. And, of course, it's uh, really triggered by uh, some personal lived experience. Um, so maybe I'll just start with that. Um, and that occurred some 37 years ago. And I had been a graduate student at Harvard in anthropology, got my master's degree, and just precipitously dropped out. I just had this existential kind of crisis about who I was. I should mention my father uh, was a professor. My grandfather was a professor. And here I was following in their footsteps and questioning whether I was just blindly doing that. And the only thing I could think of to do to resolve that dilemma was to leave and drop out. And 1971, it was kind of the year of the hippies and I grew long hair and I started hitchhiking around the United States and Canada and into Mexico. And after about five months of that, I ended up in San Francisco where literally just walking around Golden Gate Park, somebody offered me a tab of LSD and I'd never done any psychedelic drugs. But I decided I was on the road to find out uh, that Cat Stevens song and um, took it le the next day after I woke up. And, you know, the LSD experience was a pretty normal LSD type experience, wonderful. But, you know, I went to bed that night thinking, well, that was interesting, but I didn't feel changed in any way. Well, the net result of that experience was within a few days, I thought I was a, a kind of a messiah, uh, founding a new religion. I started to write a holy book. And literally for the next two months, I thought I was a reincarnation of Buddha and a reincarnation of Christ and so on. And I was so lucky because I had a group of friends who supported me through this. For two full months, I had, I had no money. Uh, I was being fed by my friends, taken care of, given a place to live. Uh, I didn't act like a messiah because I had written a holy book and distributed it. And I thought everything I needed to say was in that book. So I didn't go around babbling about this stuff. But for two months, I was allowed to do what Joseph Campbell calls the inner hero's journey of going completely into my psychotic, psychotic experience and then working my way out of it. So as a result of that, that ultimately led me for the first time in my life to explore spirituality. I had been self-defined as an atheist. And all of a sudden, after this episode of two months, I said, who the hell was this guy, Buddha and Christ, about whom I knew virtually nothing? So I started to, you know, experiment, re finding out about them, going to a meditation retreat and so on. So in the end, it changed my life. And I ultimately went back to graduate school in psychology and sort of specialized in this area of spiritual emergencies. And my work has broadened now into this DSM category of religious and spiritual problem, which uh, the entire mental health field now uh, has a diagnosis for these kinds of issues. And it also has expanded into a broader attempt to uh, make the whole mental health field more spiritually competent. My recent research and writing has been specifically on spiritual competency and i continue to be involved in projects like uh, assist and uh, a new one uh, i send in the uk and i visited a number of others uh, soteria houses in europe and so on so uh, uh, i'm delighted to see this uh, assists uh, continuing to contribute to this work That's wonderful thank you so much dr lukoff um dr rosie Kuhn. Please introduce yourself. 
I'm Dr. Rosie Kuhn. I live on beautiful Orcas Island in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I uh, studied my, my PhD is from the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, now Sophia University in Palo Alto. Um, my journey began, I grew up as just a normal Catholic person in a family of nine. My uh, parents lived in Detroit area and uh, were alcoholic, but we didn't know much about that and being in denial. Uh, I studied uh, marriage and family therapy. Uh, I lived in Nova Scotia for 10 years where I worked for the uh, Nova Scotia Commission on Drug Dependency. Uh, there I, um, I really connected to the issues of spirituality in a therapeutic orient oriented process in a sense that uh, from, a, from the mental health perspective, addictions are related to a mental health issue uh, as opposed to being a spiritual issue. And so that opened my eyes to there was something greater in the therapeutic field or the field of, of uh, assistance and healing people, healing as in healing, help assisting them and healing themselves. And that took me on a huge journey that led me to the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, uh, led me to uh, focus on spiritual direction um, as a way of beginning to integrate for myself what I thought was spirituality and therapy. Um, I, uh, I then found uh, life coaching and realized that for me, especially the way the model that I had experienced and, and in a sense uh, created more foundation in was the model of that life coaching really is uh, that place of integrating the spiritual sense into our humanity and it addresses more who we are in that essential nature and it's the nature to to express itself in the world and when it's as as we're talking about sort of here today is is sometimes the expressiveness of what needs to come up is an emergence or emergency uh, so that challenge for people really for me speaks to that place of how do we integrate and how do we see it not as a pathology but as a just a true spiritual element of our human existence uh, for me i i'm an experiencer in a more prag mostly pragmatic way my first uh, experience uh not my first but the one that was sort of the most significant i was on a sailboat in the middle of the atlantic ocean and had one of those experiences where i realized that my the fear that i that i lived uh, especially crossing the Atlantic, uh, I was unfounded in a sense. I was in this boat, the belly of this boat, which was in the belly of the ocean, which was in the belly of the earth, in the belly of the, you know, and it just went on into this beautiful, beautiful experience of fearlessness and oneness. And uh, so that was major. And then for the last eight years, I've been in a, what I call a spiritual immersion, I, I immersion in uh, really exploring who I am as this human spirit. So, so um, that's pretty much it. Hey, so I train people to be life coaches in, um, and spiritual coaches. Uh, and I love being part of ASSIST. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. We're honored to have you with us today. Thank you, Katrina. And um, Dr. Bradley Lewis, please tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're coming from. Uh, let's make sure your mic is unmuted. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? You can? You can hear me? Okay. Yeah, so I'm a professor uh, at New York University in the Gallatin School of Individualized Study, um, which is a place in the university where people uh, don't fit into disciplines and they mix things together across a variety of different disciplines. I originally trained in medicine and psychiatry, still practice day a week, um, and, but I went back and did a PhD in um, arts and humanities. And so ever since then, I've been sort of working those two sides together in a lot of ways. Um, and that's led me to sort of um, undermine a lot of the essentialism in clinical models and to open up the way in which there's a variety of ways of telling the story of our mental difference, of the way in which um, 
our non-ordinary experiences might be uh, put together in terms of um, a meaning that makes sense and a connection with other people who feel similarly. And one of the things that was been most interesting in that work, I've called it different names. I called it post-psychiatry for a while. And more lately, I've been calling it narrative psychiatry. It's um, not exactly narrative therapy. It's more like looking at um, all the different models that are out there for how to make sense of our difference and sort of relying more on narrative theory in the humanities uh, and religious studies. And so what came out of that was um, a lot of the clinical models are some sort of deficit model, some sort of pathology. There's something broken that needs to be fixed, whether it's your chemicals or your childhood or your family or your cognitions. Um, there's some sort of deficit there. Um, but when you start to get out of the clinical models, you start to find um, more generative models. There's something good about the difference. There's a way in which the difference is a gift. Um, not necessarily an easy gift to manage, but something that allows you to see or know or feel something that um, more normate people don't see or know or feel. Mm -hmm. um, and you can organize that, that around politics. You can organize that around art. Um, but one of the most interesting ones is organizing it around spirituality, um, the capacity to have non-ordinary states of consciousness that sort of move beyond everyday worldly experience um, can be a gift um, through the logic and the models of spirituality and the stories of spirituality. And that's been near and dear to myself because I too uh, seem to be only lightly connected to the material world and it doesn't take too much for me to sort of trip out into a feeling of larger connection, of sort of non-dual unity, um, a sense of um, really sort of um, wonder and magic and love and appreciation for what is despite its multiple messy complications and even tragedies um, a sense of ineffability, a sense that that's just not something that I can really put into words or that other people would understand unless they've had experiences somewhat similar to that. Um, a sense that even though it doesn't make any sense and I can't explain it and it's very paradoxical in a lot of ways, it feels absolutely right. It feels like, yeah, right, I get it, you know. And it's the kind of thing that uh, is so positive that um, not only does it allow me to sort of uh, live through the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, I think it's the kind of state that will allow a person um, and myself, hopefully, to even die happy. And I think to die happy is um, so paradoxical in our sort of modern secular world that um, these kinds of spiritual gifts um, that some of us can reach and that uh, more sort of normative clim clinical models are too quick to pathologize um, is something that assist is trying to help people sort of you know find community with and, and and I just am very honored to help participate in that. Thank you yeah it's, it's <clears throat> wonderful to have you with us today. Great so uh, let's move into our first question. Uh, we have a question today from uh, an experiencer named Laura Sheldon, and we're gonna bring Laura on. Um, hi, Laura. Uh, we're not hearing you. Is your microphone on? How about that? Okay, perfect. Okay, welcome, Laura. Please ask your question. Um, yes, well, thank you for um, inviting me to ask your question, and just hearing these introductions, I'm having this little bit of heart swelling to be in this company with this group of people, so. Um, so, um, Elizabeth asked me, gave me a little bit of prompt to create a question, and, um, and it was a quick conversation, but what came up to me was the word validation. So, my intention here is to tell a little bit of story and ask a question, and, and that, that word is the word that really came to me as a, a, a helper in this area. Um, so, um, my first uh, spiritually transformative experience uh, began in December of 2012. Um, at the time, I was a prolific seeker, a spiritual practitioner, including tons of physical yoga asana, chanting, meditation, study. Um, 
when I first unhooked from my rational mind uh, and the ability to function as I had before in society, I was 52. Everyone I encountered had expectations of me. Um, and though I was living in a very spiritual, uh, super spiritually minded community, uh, dark night of the soul didn't seem to mean total loss of function as I experienced it. Uh, no one, uh, friends, family, alternative medicine folks, my therapist at the time could accept that I could not somehow just step out of my state of extreme terror and fear and put some of my rational mind into what was happening. Just, you know, just be Laura. Um, but at the time I wasn't. I wasn't Laura, I wasn't me. Uh, in any of the interactions with psychiatrists, therapists, etc., the idea of spiritual crisis mostly was this version. Uh, did you think you were God? Uh, Jesus? Were you out in the universe? Uh, my dark experience was termed a uh, major depression with psychotic features. Never did anyone even offer uh, that the darkness and cognitive difficulty could be a spiritual emergency. Even when I was in a program that honored the idea of non-ordinary transformation, in the Buddhist tradition, um, there was bias towards what that might look like. My actual experience was one of terror and extreme anxiety uh, and extreme aloneness. Uh, in my, in my spiritual battle between the light and the dark in my psyche. It took a year uh, and concluded with the most extreme expression of my internal battle uh, and attempted suicide. That near-death-like experience allowed me to wake up uh, to a more functioning, more rational state and gave me a foothold back out of terror into the beginning of my journey as it is now which is pretty fabulous, by the way, um, just to add that in there. Um, if I created this story, just to kind of make context here, uh, to me, the idea of validation in any kind of extreme event or state, psychic gift, feeling of oneness, or dark night of the soul, etc., seems to be dependent on everyone's belief systems. This includes family, the traditional folks, the alternative practitioners, and all of the mental health providers that might come in contact. Um, affirmation um, to the person in the, in the event, that the experience for them is real, and that it can pass, uh, that there is acceptance toward a wide range of possibilities and outcomes. If I had had, if I had someone hear my words, this isn't me, this isn't me, um, and be respectful and curious enough to explore that um, outside their filters, outside of their expectations, even honor the fight between the, do the dark and the light um, and ask me questions in a safe way regarding what it was like for me. Perhaps, uh, perhaps that would have softened the extreme um, and dangerous nature of going through the darkness alone. Um, so I, I put that little perhaps there because, um, as I said, you know, my journey is quite mythic and um, was my journey. I, it was my hero's journey and I am here in, in this place studying this subject matter for years now since this was began and I've gone in and out again. So I find it all very rich. So the question, um, how do we get providers to validate someone's actual current experience and beliefs at the time when someone is extremely dysregulated, whether it is dark or light and expanded. So, um, panelists, feel free to jump in with your thoughts. Well, I, I'll jump in. Um, so you're talking about how to train or prepare mental health professionals to be competent in dealing with these kinds of spiritual crises. And that's a question I've thought about, and I've certainly, you know, given workshops, which certainly fill in some of the knowledge pieces of that, you know, a competency as knowledge, skills, 
and attitudes. That's the sort of competency model that's used throughout healthcare. Um, so you can certainly in, in, you know, give didactic things. There's quite a literature now on dark night of the soul and how that's a spiritual crisis that presents looking very much like depression and they overlap. Um, then there's skills. How do you work with that? How do you help a person uh, through that kind of a journey? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll mention that at, as part of my journey, there was a point after I went really high up, being Buddha in Christ and all that, I went really low and became suicidal and had a lot of thoughts about ending my life. And, stuff. and I think that dynamic is one of the sources of my growth. And I think I've acknowledged that in some writing I've done, but it's, there's a literature on this exact phenomenon. So again, a therapist should have that knowledge, but also know how to work with somebody to kind of empower them to more embrace that experience. And there's poetry about this that can be uh, shared. Um, so uh, I, I just, I'll, I'll make one other comment here because it's part of the theme of my professional shtick. My doctoral dissertation was a holistic health program for people with schizophrenia that I ran, a 12-week program I ran four times at a state hospital. Um, and that is what I want to uh, highlight here is the importance of also including very grounding and uh, lifestyle kinds of uh, things into any work with people in any kind of a... Uh, well, spiritual crisis, but really any crisis, but, and that is practices like uh, some form of exercise, a mindfulness practice, nutrition that's beneficial. The amount of junk food this people in this country eat is astonishing. Uh, so it all, to view this as a mind, body, spirit issue, um, so that you're not ignoring, you know, uh, the other important dimension. Well, in this case, I'm highlighting now the body dimension. Okay, so I'll leave it at there. Those are some of my thoughts. I'll jump in. So, Laurie, the first thing that showed up for me, uh, even, even as a practitioner of many, many, many years, what showed up for me was, in a sense, my own fear of, oh my God, what do I do with this? How do I see this? What do I... Um, how do I help her? You know, all of those kinds of things that are challenging to who I am uh, as a human being, uh, as, as a spiritual practitioner, as a therapist, all of those things come in in the moment of, oh my God, how do I, I don't know what to do. So I, I say that because I think that's the first aspect of us as, uh, as clinicians or support people is to acknowledge for ourselves, wow, this is really could be a really this is scary for me okay so when i acknowledge that then i can start to to piece things together in a way that helps you you being the general you uh helps you uh begin to uh, accept the scariness of what it's like to be you in this and the uh the support of how to be in this moment with you in not only the scariness but the um it feels like the inevitability that it, you're going down and you don't know how to come up. All of those aspects that are human to human that, does, that goes beyond the clinical, the clinical tools, the clinical uh, uh, tech, uh, uh, strategies, the clinical models, and just human to human. And that's a really challenging place, I think, for most uh, therapists, clinicians of all sorts, is just be human to human in this dynamic of, of wow, you're in a lot of scariness, you're in a lot of pain uh, on all levels. And what's it like, in a sense for me, it's just like having the conversation, what's it like inside there with you? And what's possible for you in here? And it might be nothing, it might be total despondency in this moment. And just to allow and accept and validate the truth of that, uh, to me is, is the beginning of what's, what's to unfold as potential for bringing about a healing in this crisis. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just add, um, I don't know, it's such a beautiful question, how to get providers to validate, to honor, to um, respect, to understand. 
Um, I, it, it touches me because so many of my college students are asking, how can we have a better world? How can we get the country to, um, you know, move closer to human values? And um, it's, it feels to me like that, um, having got a lot of gray hairs, hoping that I could get the center to change and sort of spread this out rapidly um, because it's the right thing to do or because it uh, makes sense, you know, theoretically. Um, I've come to feel like uh, that way is, it's not completely blocked, but it's hard to feel a sense of hope that um, you can get the center to do the right thing. Certainly in the mental health system, so much of uh, the way we make sense of it is organized through research that's coming through, uh, a lot of it's coming through the pharmaceutical industry. And so um, to get them to think about these things, unless, you know, and there is some possibility that there will be medication around it. And then when that happens or drugs that become more mainstream, then you'll probably see a relatively quick <laughs> transformation of public opinion. But until that happens, because uh, when they put the marketing machine behind it, um, but until that happens, I think the thing is um, coalitions of the already like-minded, um, finding all kinds of people, instead of trying to change minds, to sort of coalesce the people that already understand, that already see it and to build networks and communities of people who already are living in that uh, frame of reference already. I think, I think organizing the like-minded is, is gonna be more hopeful right now than trying to change um, the uh, un, uninterested. <laughs> well, said. well said, thank you. And, and thanks so much for your question, Laura. Thanks for being with us. Yes, thank you for having me. And, and it's really delightful to be around this like-minded community. So thank you for... Okay. Um, so we're going to move into our second poll, um, which will pop up on your screen. And our second poll question is, how would you like to see ASSIST focus its resources? So when you have a moment to um, take a look at that and give us an answer, we we'll keep that up for a few minutes. Um, all right, and moving into our next question, um, one of the questions that I raised in my dissertation research is how the resistance of one's spiritual emergence because of fear and lack of cultural context may impact the intensity with which their process ultimately comes forward as a spiritual emergency. Because someone having a spiritual emergence type of experience is unlikely to have a cultural framework to define their experience, how can we, as professionals, assist with creating a language for our clients to use that does not limit them to the medical model? Uh, so I'd like to hear from you, what assessments or interventions might you consider when sitting with a client who may be presenting with a spiritual Katrina, would you ask the question this one more time? Sure. So um, the, the question is basically, when you're sitting with a client who may be presenting with a spiritual emergency but doesn't have a, a context, a language, right. what assessments or interventions might you consider to help that person express what they're going through and to help to give them a framework to consider that perhaps this is a spiritual emergency? How might you approach that with them outside of the mainstream approach? I mean, one, I would jump in on that one. I mean, one, I, in a way, one of the things that I think is really important here is, is in, in, inside the question itself, which is, yeah, how do you find a community? How do, a, a framework is also a community of people. And so if you're thinking in a non-ordinary way, um, one option is to process that yourself and come up with an individual story about that. Another option is to find, are there like-minded souls out there that are thinking in a somewhat similar way? Um, sometimes the dark night of the soul logic is um, about being in a kind of spiritual exile, about being um, a yearning for a kind of community where other people speak a similar kind of language. And so some exploration to see, is there a religious, is there a spiritual but not religious, is there a mindful, a yoga, 
you know, um, uh, some sort of place where the person maybe first got exposed to some ideas like this um, that could be nurtured, that could be repaired in some way, if they're broken in a way that could be fixed. So I think, yeah, like um, being open to realizing that th this is partly an individual issue, but it's also a question of fit in a cultural setting and what kind of work to help a person sort of make that link um, is, is, is one of the sort of um, pieces to the puzzle that, that doesn't always get, get tended to, but I think it's critical. Um, I, for me, our, I think we're all saying the same thing in terms of our consensus reality uh, doesn't have really, we, we can talk about it, and, but we don't really have much room for that human, that, that what we're talking about in terms of spiritual emergence, spiritual immersion is, is part of the normal human evolution, normal spiritual human evolution. And we don't, in our therapies, and I think this is what you're working with, David, is bringing that, and, and to you too, Bradley, that, that sense of integration of our humanness into, and, and the spirituality into, the, into everyday life, if you will. And so our languaging of even the humanness, uh, Carl Rogers is like, this is a human experience this individual is having. And so Katrina, looking at you in this moment, it's like, you're having a human experience but we keep trying to contextualize it in terms of an ego, ego or mentalized experience when it is perhaps a little bit, some of that, but you're having a human experience. And the ability for uh, uh, the, the supporter to hold that space that this is a human experience that you're having really helps. Even though the person goes, yes, but nobody believes me. Yes, but nobody's addressing me as a human being they're seeing me as a as a, a diagnosis or as a mental process or a, a something that needs to be medicated nobody's seeing me as this human being that's having this human experience even though it's a it's you know we're in this immersion immersion of the spiritual elements so again i come back probably it's my message <laughs> all, all across the board is our ability as a as a as a, as a clinician or healer or what, whoever that is to, to, to see through the eyes of a human being to the eyes of the human being and say, I, I, I see you as this human being that's going through this human experience. And I get that we don't address you as this human being with this heart, this experience. And I, I get it. So that's, again, that's what, that's my answer. So, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I want to give a little historical perspective, which is that, you know, I think for uh, certainly early in my work in this area, it was just mind blowing to a lot of people who were experiencing this kind of crisis to, if they were very lucky, maybe end up with a union or somebody like that, uh, they could be given this perspective, but it was really rare. And then, of course, Stan and Christina Groff wrote uh, the book on spiritual emergency, started this organization, and I was involved in it. We had many conferences with like 500 people and so on. So it started to get some traction. And then, of course, with the internet, it made it much more readily accessible. So I think now what I'm seeing is a lot of people are self-diagnosing themselves as having a spiritual transformative experience, spiritual emergency, spiritual crisis, dark night of the soul. You know, they, they actually are coming up with a, a lot of these kinds of parallels, which I think that kind of knowledge is helpful as giving a person an alternative narrative to pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, they still need probably some very concrete assistance in that process, but nevertheless, I think a lot uh, the uh, knowledge part of this, knowing about this as a phenomenon, is much more readily available now. And YouTube, of course, too. You, you type in some of kind of like spiritual emergency, and there are dozens of uh, YouTube videos, including some of my own, on that topic. That may, at this point, uh, outpace you know the the tech stuff that's uh, yeah. 
spiritual versions and people yeah. find it on YouTube, which I think is in general helpful, even though of course it's not curated or, you know, uh, some of it, I don't think is that helpful, but there's a lot of really good stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're building the cultural framework. That's what this is all about. We're building it and spaces like the internet allow experiencers to have a voice and develop language pull from what they already know and uh, as helping professionals uh, pointing them toward those resources and holding space and identifying what language they already have uh, like Dr. Lewis said and helping them to use that as a starting point. And some of them are, are functioning as communities already like the Icarus group on Facebook I mean, they really do actually provide concrete support to each other uh, online and offline, so. And I think that also inclu uh, it, this includes the assist forum uh, that has a lot of people who are joining and uh, connecting and supporting each other and giving information and uh, testimonials and support, that that's also a really good, good place to go is the assist forum. Yeah. Is that on Facebook or where is that located? That's on the assist website. And okay. I don't know if there's, that's all I know. Yeah, that's a, that's a secure forum where people can register uh, as an experiencer. And it's just a forum for experiencers to come and share and uh, build community around this and have others holding space for sharing their stories. So, yeah, Has assist considered Facebook? As a, as a community? Well, I think... Yeah, I don't pay much attention to it. I check it maybe once a month, but yeah, I, I don't know if it's an option for building community. Well, I, I think we chose um, to have a secure forum so that we can really vet and pay attention to who's joining. And um, it's, it's more of, it's meant to be a safer experience for people to okay. share without, um, you know, <laughs> without our ability to keep track of people who aren't coming through assist. Mm -hmm. That seems, that seems huge to me. That seems so important. The difference that makes a difference if you've got a place to go where people understand, you know, how you're um, thinking about this that others might not. That just seems, it's light, light, night and day. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Um, so Elizabeth, I'll turn it over to you for our third question. Yes, thank you. Um, can you all hear me now? Yes. My off mute? Okay, great. <clears throat> so uh, we know that experiencers have come through psychiatric systems that may have misunderstood and erroneously labeled and treated them for psychiatric ailments that ultimately uh, created more trauma and dis-ease, where there, some of them are actually diagnosed with PTSD after their mental health experience. Can you speak to how we can build rapport with such experience? Harbor resentment towards all helping professionals while we can still main, uh, maintain a sensitivity to their unique challenges? Well, I mean, just a word about it. I, um, I mean, I, David mentioned the Icarus Project. Um, there's another website called Mad in America. Um, you know, this uh, sense of being traumatized by the mental health system is a, unfortunately, all too common one. Um, people have some sort of issue with difference and they go for help in the most obvious place and they feel misunderstood or um, hurt in some ways or made worse. And that's, that includes people that have spiritual sort of experiences that get overly diagnosed and overly treated, but it also includes people that have all kinds of other experiences that get overdiagnosed and overtreated. So, so yeah, so a community um, recognizing that our mental health system is too small-minded, too narrow-minded, um, too unable to think um, with any kind of um, diversity or complexity, and at the same time hold that medications may be useful for some people for certain things, normative treatment may be useful for certain people for certain things. Um, it isn't trying, to, I think the challenge is to hold that some people do 
find the sort of mainstream mental health systems helpful. They're able to use the tools um, so that um, while we open up additional tools, while we join solidarity with people that have been traumatized, we don't want to at the same time demonize tools that have been helpful for those people that do find them helpful. So it's a, it's a capacity to hold in mind some of that complexity um, that sort of gets outside the box of the normative approaches, um, but at the same time um, recognizes that they can be valuable too for, for the people that they're helpful for. Well, and I'll just add that in a sense, this is a subset of the question every therapist faces with every unique client, and that's how do I build a therapeutic alliance with this individual and their wounds and their history and their values and so on. And I know, um, Certainly, you know, it has to start with uh, listening to their story, their experience, uh, really getting them to be able to tell it from kind of beginning to end, uh, even the uh, altered state parts that sometimes people uh, have some embarrassment about and, and so on. Uh, so getting that whole story, but in any given session I work, uh, not in private practice anymore, but when I did, in any given session, if I was going to spend an hour with somebody, you know, I want them to leave feeling better. So some of the time during the session, I might just have us take deep breaths together, you know, just make, help them to feel grounded and hopefully provide them with the technique they can use to provide some of their own grounding, you know, in the other rest of their life and so on. And then I also, as I said, discuss all these other issues about exercise and diet and how to get them back into a place of feeling better about themselves and feeling better in general. So I give a, I try to connect with them in their whole person quality uh, as, build, as part of building that therapeutic alliance. So what, so uh, the, what part of what this is about for the, you know, this event today, this uh, discussion is this place of building trust and, um, and so that's what you're talking about, David and Bradley, in terms of building trust through the therapeutic alliance. Uh, and also this place of respect, respecting the elements of the um, psychiatric psychology field that works and is helpful, and also being willing to see what's not working and, and support our, our clients and support our, the individuals in having the true experience that they're having, that challenge of, uh, may perhaps a sense of the trauma and that trauma coming from a sense of betrayal or a sense of isolation, a sense of not being seen, whatever that is, that, that they feel dismissed, disregarded, and traumatized. So our, um, for us to, uh, to listen and trust, much like you're both saying, and David, and specifically like trusting that this individual is having a, a, an experience that's true to them and aligning with them and uh, supporting them in, in experiencing that place of safety with you or with whoever the ther their therapist, healer, uh, support person is, is cultivating that, that, that space of safety for them to get realigned with the truth of themselves. And also like with any element of PTSD or trauma that they have an opportunity to really perhaps uh, work through the elements that creates the, the, the trauma so that, so that it's, we'll call it healed, so it's gone. That's, that's what we want. <clears throat> Great, okay, thank you. Um, so for our for, fourth question, uh, we have uh, Kirsten Cameron with us. And Kirsten is currently completing her PhD in Integral and Transpersonal Psychology at the California Institute for, of Inst Integral Studies. And Kirsten is studying therapeutic practices for working with those who've had spiritually transformative experiences. As an experiencer herself, she's worked in private practice for the last decade in both standard therapeutic care, as well as with spiritual seekers and those integrating spiritual experiences. 
He also has, is a certified master hypnotherapist and a graduate of the first assistant career support facilitator training. Hi, Kirsten. I need to take you off mute. Here you go. Okay. Hi, Kristen. Great. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. And Katrina, thanks for the introduction. I, I would love to ask two questions, but I'll let you tell me if we have the time for them. Um, so what I wanted to ask the panel, and certainly based on Dr. Lukov's introduction, you can answer this, uh, that some people who are experiencing a spiritual emergency have ecstatic moments or rapture or direct contact with God or other spiritual masters. And sometimes this contact is maintained through connective practices well after what you might consider the main emergency. Outside of this context, you know, it's often labeled this behavior as manic symptoms or delusions of grandeur. So I wondered if panelists could offer an alternative for how we might assist the client to understand and integrate rapture type and connective type experiences into their lives without causing dysfunction in an ongoing way. Somebody on a motorcycle there? Not on mine. I don't know where. Kristen, yeah. I'm wondering if you could just add a little bit more context text like what's where does this question come from for you that it's pretty it's I can't I'm trying to wrap my head around it I just need a little more context of of the question so I can address myself to it uh, just thinking of particular experience or instance of um, a person who feels that they are connected with God uh, or an ascended master or a spirit guide or some some entity that helps them and then that continues to be a part of their life as they begin to integrate so it's not something that they drop uh, this behavior of i speak to god or god speaks to me can be considered delusions of grandeur um so how to hold that and how to uh, work with a client within that? How do, how, how do they understand it? How to make that seem, um, how to integrate that basically, how to integrate it into their lives and continue to hold it because it's clearly a valuable a connection that they have created. Great, thank you. I guess I'll, I'll start with what, with what shows up for me, which is quite often when people have these experiences, they do take it on from an egoic perspective, that they become this, I'm special, I'm, um, I'm something to give to the universe. And so they put themselves out there or much, sort of what you were talking about, David, as you were saying, Kristen, is that place of, you know, this to be true. And yet, uh, the way that we know that is different either from the egoic self or from the truth of the of the of truth of the heart we'll say and so the integration the true integration is in the heartness of it and not necessarily in the egoic element um, a client of mine um, had an experience where she knew herself to be mary magdalene and so she had this this knowing but the knowing uh and the rapture of that and the, the sensitivities and the memories and all of those kinds of things it, from an egoic place really was destructive in her current human life. Because it's like, why does my life look the way it does if I'm Mary Magdalene? So that element of the integration is not just that I'm the persona of, or I speak to God that, but that, that place of the integration is, Okay, so that's true about me, but that still Mary Magdalene was just just a human being, you know, just a human being. And so in that process, how do we be, how does that individual be that uh, from the heart, from the, the true integrate, integrated elements, as opposed to the shoulds, the shouldn'ts, the rules, the beliefs, the, the structure we create about what that means about the person who's having that relationship with uh, the extraordinary. 
so that place of integration is not I, I hear this a lot from people who have had their uh, spiritual experience and they want to write the book they want to be out there I'm special and I as opposed to that's not, it's usually not about that it's usually about this element of integration of who I am in this in this process so that's mm -hmm. my offering <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add a, along along the lines of what Rosie's saying. You know, I think that uh, we're too quick sometimes to see therapy as about change, as about there's something in us that we're trying to make uh, different. Um, I think that therapy can often be a place where we work to come to peace with our difference, a work a place where we come to understand our difference more fully, um, come to see um what our role with our difference is out in a world where uh it's not a world of sameness it's not a world where everybody sees the world like i do um and i might have important work to do i might have important um sub communities to join um and but i'm not uh i'm not really in therapy to change that i'm not trying to change that in fact um to the degree that the difference that's um, that's um, at issue is a kind of gift, change would be the last thing you'd want to do in a lot of ways. But that doesn't mean that um, there can't be quite a bit of work around sort of um, flourishing with that difference and flourishing um, within that difference. So, so celebrating the difference and also um, you know, supporting how one finds um, their feet in that difference. I think it's a big part of what therapy work in this kind of domain is. Yeah. And I would add um, that this is a, reminds me of the dilemma that Richard Alpert faced on his journey to become Ram Dass. It's like every time he took LSD, he had these ecstatic, rapturous experiences but he wanted to know, do I always have to take some pill to do that? Is there a way to get there, these states uh, on my own? And that's what led him to go to India and come back with all these new things like chanting and meditating and so on that permeated into the culture. Um, and I think my work with several of my clients over the years has been, you know, what, what's a practice that would work for them? Qigong, mindfulness, you know, sitting meditation practices, you know, walking in nature, you know, some kind of thing that is actually a practice, something they do regularly, where they can access those kinds of uh, altered states in a, you know, less uh, intrusive way. You have some degree of control over it. You kind of invoke it. Uh, so it gives you, you know, control over it, whereas um, often these experiences at first occur spontaneously, and that's how a person gets even aware of this as a possibility. But then to pursue it, it may be very, you know, one may need to actually develop some kind of practice over time. And, and I, I love what you're saying, David, and I, I watched uh, Ram Dass's most recent um, documentary uh on uh, netflix and uh it's it's that place that i think you're talking about getting to kirsten which is you know there's first the experience the spontaneous experience and then there's like okay how do i sustain that how do i create create it in my life with practices but then there's the place where it's like it's an everyday occurrence so i i live on orcas island it's a natural environment where I'm immersed in that quality of rapture to whatever degree it is. And so I immerse my life and I, and I, I create a, an environment and a culture which supports that state of being, uh, of, of rapture, if you will, uh, that, <laughs> that's sustainable for me. And that's, I think, what, what Ram Dass was saying in that, how do you, get, how do you first get there but then how do you practice sustaining that in your everyday life? And, uh, and uh, there are certain practices I know I do and I need, but also how do you cultivate the culture 
the environment around you, your home, so that you're more close to having that on an ongoing basis. So I just wanted to also add that. So thank you. Thank you very much. I, I love those answers. It's about community and cultivation and control and um, not, being, not being a victim of it, but uh, actually integrating it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask my second question, Katrina, or is there enough time? Do we have some other questions waiting from the uh, attendees? We do. We've got about four questions so far from uh, from other people. So I think maybe we should move on. But Kirsten, thank you so very much for being willing to come on and ask that question. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Okay, so we are going to take some questions from the audience today. We have some people in line. Uh, waiting to ask a question. Uh, before we do, I'm going to let you know about our third poll for the for today. Uh, we want to know what you are most excited um, to learn about at the conference in Chicago this October. So I'm going to get that going, and then you can just answer those questions uh, when you're ready. But um, I'd like to invite uh, Tina Fields onto the line. And let me get her on so she can ask her question. All right, Tina, you're coming on. You can ask your question. And let me unmute you. That would help, right? <laughs> there you go. All right. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm looking up. Let me fix that. That's okay. You're, you're fine. Okay, I appreciate you uh, coming and letting me ask this. Um, I lead wilderness rites of passage trips. And I've noticed an assist related issue arising in that industry and also at academic conferences, mostly the ones that have to do with topics involving consciousness, spirituality, anomalous experience, particularly those that include experiential sessions. It's this, that in these settings, Facilitators are actually actively trying to induce altered states of consciousness of one sort or another. And yet, they're not, we, they are not trained in dealing with the effects of those when they arise. And so the question is, how do we begin talking about responsibility in those settings in a really useful way and to train non-clinical leaders to both know what they're doing, <laughs> more on a spiritual level, and then to deal with the effects and participants that arise both then at the moment and then long-term afterwards. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> well, I, I know there's a literature on uh, kind of uh, na nature-induced mystical experiences, some of which have been done with power bound like programs. They've even administered, you know, uh, a mysticism scale before and after. So mm -hmm. I, I think they are priming people for these kinds of experiences. Um, and yeah, you're right. There, there's a, a risk there because for some people, these are so powerful and unlike other experiences they've had in their life, mm -hmm. that they can be uh, off-putting or scary. So I, I do think that it, there's a need for some preparation and most people in those roles to know how to facilitate, know how to listen. Do they get training in empathic listening, uh, non-pathologizing, uh, how to uh, express appreciation and respect and support people's experiences. There are some basic things that can be mm -hmm. done. Um, I think, you know, you know to prepare people for that because basically I think that's a wonderful place to have those kinds of experiences. I'd rather people have the experiences out in nature rather than uh, Disneyland or something, <laughs> or, on, or just on psychedelics. I mean, in a way, if you can make that connection out in nature, you know, that's, that's a lifelong uh, asset. Yeah. Nature's available to us <laughs> pretty much 24 seven. Um, so, um, 
you know, I think it would take some thinking through, of, you know, how to prepare a person, you know, get, would the people who run these programs be willing to devote, I don't know, a day of training for how to work with people's uh, nature-based mystical experiences or something like that, you know, then you could start carving out a curriculum mm -hmm. to prepare people better with role plays and case examples and so on. Mm. That's a good idea. But I think what I'm hearing, Tina, though, is that what the question is, is how do we get these people to want to be responsible and accountable for what they're potentially creating and cultivating in their participants? And uh, is, that, is that correct? That's what I'm hearing is how do we get people to want to be responsible and accountable for that? Is that what the qu the question is? Yeah, I think in the in the wilderness rites of passage work, there is there is that we are all trained in uh, council practice, which is a deep listening practice, and in mirroring, which is um, finding the mythology and what they're saying. So right there in the field, there is that. But if somebody really, I mean, I'll use a colloquial term, really wigs out, most folks aren't trained in dealing with that. And in the conferences, the other, the other aspect I say, that really was horrifying. I've seen many, many crazy anomalous experiences happen at an academic conference and nobody is prepared to deal with it. So, right, how do we begin the conversation and, and what kind of training would that be? Dave, Dr. Lukoff, I loved your idea about carving out a training, but what would that look like? Well, uh, let me share the example that Jack Cornfield the meditation teacher. He's also a PhD psychologist. And in, uh, I forget which book, but I've referenced it in some of my writing so I could track it down. Uh, he shares a case of somebody who showed up at one of uh, the retreats at Spirit Rock mm -hmm. and then decided to meditate all night on his own, which is an option there. You can stay in the Zendo and meditate as long as you want, even after nine o'clock when it ends. And he did that. And then he marches into the dining room, the full hall for breakfast, uh, which is eaten in silence. And he starts, you know, doing karate moves and telling people he can see their chakras. And, you know, he's just totally kind of wigged out. And Jack Cornfield, you know, instead of calling 911 and getting an ambulance to take him to a hospital, uh, took a couple of his senior students aside had them escort him out of there and start, I think they had they did a bunch of different things, but I think the first thing was just get him walking, get him moving, get some way of uh, expressing this energy that he was full of. Mm -hmm. Then they got him working in the garden. They had him taking hot baths. Uh, they brought in special food for him because they considered meat to be more grounding than the vegetarian fare there. So they spent a few days really working with him and getting him grounded again. And then he was actually able to start the meditation retreat again, mm. uh, you know, with some supervision and limiting sessions and so on. But they were able to bring him back in this, uh, using a variety of these interventions. Well, thank you so much. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Lewis. Well, I, just real quick, I, I think that, um, I mean, the question highlights a bigger issue, which is what kind of support do we have more largely for people whose uh, spiritual experiences um, are very destabilizing? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think that the mystical, you know, experience literature suggests that um, many people's mystical experiences is connected to some kind of trigger and it doesn't have to be in theogens there can be lots of different triggers and some of those will be spontaneous including you know a walk in nature um, or um, a certain sort of uh, night of love making all kinds of different things can trigger and I think you can go back to sort of Timothy Leary's set, setting and substance you know what what is the state of mind that someone is in when they're exposed to the trigger what is the setting through which they're supposed to the trigger? What kind of support and, 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 can, and, and sort of care is going on? What is the trigger? And that, that, that these, these um, activities that will sort of give people triggers, um, yeah, they have, they're not all, it's not all going to be warm and fuzzy. Sometimes it's going to be very destabilizing. And I think understanding that 
uh, not so much that we're scared of it, but realizing we don't have supports for people whose triggers take them in these places, whether it's in conferences, out in the woods, or just walking through the park. You know, there's, there's lots of different um, triggers that are out there, and we don't have a good um, sort of um, support system for that that isn't overly pathologized. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that I, don't, I think yeah I don't I think it's a hard question and in, in that way not that things can't be done along the lines of, of what David and other are talking about but it's also bigger than that yeah yeah thank you so much for asking that question Tina that's actually a question near and dear to my heart too and an issue that's near and dear to mine so I was happy to see somebody bring that question up yeah. okay thank you I'm gonna go ahead and take you off camera now thank you for being uh, for coming on. Okay, so we've got a few more questions and we've got about 15 more minutes to answer questions. So we'll take about five minutes each. I'm gonna read two of them and then we'll bring one more person on camera. Um, Sarah, one of our, actually our peer support group facilitator trainees asks, aside from those therapists who are well-versed in uh, spiritually transformative experiences or becoming knowledgeable, what other resources are envisioned for experiencers? For instance, retreat centers, programs, conferences, networks such as SEN. Um, so does anybody have a vision that they'd like to share or share about programs that they already know about? Dr. Lukoff, I know that you have a program, Spiritual Competency Resource Center, and that's available <coughs> for experiencers as well as uh, helping professionals, correct? Could, could an experience? Yeah, it's a resource center that provides uh, uh, articles, uh, counts, cases, and so on. Uh, it's not a uh, interactive site, uh, so I don't you know, resp- I don't have a forum. I don't, uh, you know, deal with people's actual experiences. If they send me stuff, I tell them, sorry, I'm, I'm best. I don't do work with individuals at this point in my life. <laughs> so um, I don't offer any of those kinds of uh, direct services. It, it, you know, it's been a long standing dream of people in this movement, like Stan and Chris- Stan Groff now and, uh, was of Christina's as well, in fact, maybe even more hers, to have a uh, residential setting where people could go through some of these kinds of experiences the way they did at places like Soteria and Diabasis. Uh, And there are a few Soteria houses still in existence, uh, one in Alaska, I believe one in New Hampshire now, and then a few in Europe, where people, who are in this kind of an altered state uh, and uh, not functioning in ordinary reality well, uh, not able to take care of themselves, they can uh, find a sanctuary and their experiences will be supported and validated and they'll be kind of protected from being dangerous. Uh, And, uh, you know, the research of Soteria showed that, um, and they worked with first episode people, that between 50 and 60% of people who otherwise would be treated as having some kind of psychotic disorder, 50 to 60% will emerge on their own without medication. So um, there's a lot of good rationale and what of course has uh, been the barrier in the United States has been the pharmaceutical companies because they've created uh, the myth that the standard of care for treating psychosis is antipsychotic medication. And a psychiatrist who do, does not use that is vulnerable to being sued, as was Thomas Zaz, the famous anti-psychiatry uh, myth of mental illness guy. Uh, he was sued for not using medication. And it was a you know, message to basically every physician out there that, you know, they need to adhere to it. So I know the SEND movement is now looking to open up a facility in the UK where the, the, the government has actually been pushing back against pharmaceutical companies and looking for non-pharmaceutical approaches. 
Um, so that's still, I think, the dream is to have, to have residences where people can uh, be supported through these kinds of things. And there are some in the United States, they're not part of the public mental health sector. There's uh, two wind horses, one in uh, San Luis Obispo and one in Nova Scotia, I believe. There's. And uh, they can provide pe people with uh, that kind of a sanctuary where they can uh, use things like mindfulness practices and just, you know, inter interpersonal contact in a uh, wholesome way to help ground people's experiences. So there are a few models like that that I... Yeah, thank you. It sounds like we're going to have to um, find a way to protect our psychiatrist uh, from this litigious environment before we can have a full system shift, but it's good to hear that there's something happening here in the United States. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to have to move on to the next question. I apologize that our other presenters didn't get to speak on that. Um, but very quickly, uh, we have uh, uh, somebody here today who wants to know if anybody here is aware of research on life before life issues and knows anything um, about uh, the, the challenges that we face in this life are designed by a life before this life. Is anybody aware of any research on that or know anything about, you know, uh, if it's true or what we know? There's a, a I, I don't know the book and I don't know the author, but I know the fellow that does, or, uh, but I know there's this fellow that has done and trains people to uh, work with hypnosis that takes people into the life before life. Uh, and there's a number of books out there. You probably can Google that, uh, but I don't know the, the person's name. I've read the book. I, I think, Rosie, you might be talking about past life regression work. No, it's between, it's between the, I think what, if this person is, if I'm getting it right, it's, it's between lives. So that it's, a, the hypnosis takes a person between lives so that they're seeing what they learned from a previous life, what they're, in in the moment and then what they're intending to come into in this lifetime i think uh we're getting some feedback from the audience about that uh they're they're talking about a michael newton md and robert schwartz uh then there's also research and books by uh carol bowman and then uh, dr michael newton um and Great. and then i believe uh, Kirsten Cameron is also saying that she does this work as well. Okay. So awesome. yes, it's somebody else said Dr. Michael Newton. Great. So okay. that's, that's good to know. Thank you audience for that information. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Very well informed audience today. Awesome. Yes. Very exciting. Okay. And to, now we're going to bring on uh, Beverly Brodsky who has a question and Beverly um, was one of the original assist people that got assist off the ground. So um, uh, Beverly, you sh there you are. I'm going to unmute you here. Just give me one minute. Hi, Beverly. Hi. It's good Hi. to see you. It's wonderful to be here with all, with all this esteemed panel. And um, what I wanted to know, because I, um, well, I've been an IANS group leader for 28 years. I would say IANS is a great resource. Um, IANS has focused. The, the reason we have assist is because IANS has focused so much on the research and not as much on the, the, the experiencer, uh, experiencers and our wisdom. Um, so uh, for, for uh, background, it would be, IANS has wonderful studies and research um, and the support groups, they actually refer questions to us, the support group leaders, to help uh, other people because um, we have the most knowledge. Um, so Be Beverly, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second. So IANS is the International Association for Near-Death Studies, is that correct? Yes. I just wanted to. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, to clarify <laughs> um, that. Um, yes, a lot of multisyllabic 
words. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to know, I just finished the peer support group training um, in ASSIST, and I'm wondering if um, for some of these issues, um, I think that we, we as a peer support group would be um, the subject matter expert like we are for, for IANS. Um, and I wonder if, if people have these questions or these experiences, um, could we have a role, at, you know, as a non-professional? Non <clears throat> for me, it's, it's like all of the questions that have been asked, uh, you uh, as uh, peer group uh, mentors and peer groups themselves are those places that most therapists can't get to in terms of the support, the validation, the uh, life experience, the parallels in, in those experiences that create that sense of resp uh, respect, validation, um, and honoring of an individual's experience. So I think it, you, you being the big you, uh, tr truly uh, enhance that process for, for an individual. Yeah, I would just add, um, I mean, I can't think the basic principle of nothing about us without us, that um, any kind of work in any kind of area like this um, needs to include people with firsthand experience and who are the key stakeholders um, in that domain. And I think that uh, that goes all the way to uh, mutual support, mutual aid, um, can be the most vitalizing. I mean, the Icarus Project, which came up earlier, have the slogan, which I love, friends make the best medicine. And I think it's really true when you can be shoulder to shoulder with people who've gone through similar kinds of things um, and find community that way, it's hard to beat it, and it really is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think IANS is a model of how uh, to go about making changes in how our culture has viewed uh, near-death experiences to the point where I think it's now routinely accepted in uh, ICUs that people will have these kinds of experiences and doesn't call for antipsychotic medication and so on. And of course, it's been helped by the fact that they've had good media exposure, movies and best-selling books and so on. So I, I can see where uh, spiritually transformative experiences uh, you know, uh, could follow uh, many of those steps and is really, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Beverly, for bringing this up. This is excellent because as we talked about in training, what we're really hoping is that as we train and certify our uh, peer support group facilitators, uh, I mean, it takes almost a year, right, for them to become fully certified. We're hoping that they can advertise these groups to their local uh, mental health professionals and have their mental health professionals refer their clients to our support groups. And it seems to me that if we could get that, uh, the local mental health professionals on board, that they would actually refer to this group, that that would also create therapeutic trust, that that would go a long way towards creating therapeutic trust when your mental health professional says, gee, there's this support group that Beautiful. you might go to while, you know, as well. So... How would you recommend that we that we uh, advertise these groups to psychiatrists and, and, and psychologists, therapists? Um, I, I'm at a loss um, because it would have to be um, have to be therapists who are not who don't buy into the current model. Mm -hmm. So it might, might be. Um, Finding um, is there is there something like I know in in the medical field there is the um, uh, there are groups for doctors um, who are non traditional. I'm not. Um, I, I one of my first talks was to the American Associate American Association for, I can't, 
my memory is not what, what, what it once was, and, and I had a couple of strokes. So, um, American Association for is an American Holistic. Yes, Associ the American Med Holistic Medical Association. Okay. Or. Um, Is there an equivalent thing for psychiatrists? And psychologists are more likely to be open to this because psychiatrists are fresher to prescribe, prescribe. And um, I went to a conference where they were talking about um, getting people off of um, other drugs. And one of the therapists there uh, said, that he would never work with someone who was taking medi medication of any kind. I mean, there, there's, um, there is more, in my experience, there's more integrative health, alternative health, complementary health in medicine than there is in psychiatry. Mm. Curious mm -hmm. enough. Um, but what there is in psychiatry is a whole resistance movement. Um, I mentioned MAD in America earlier, and it's not singly focused on spiritual experience, but it would be, I think, a community that includes that as an understanding that we're over-medicalizing and over-treating things that can be um, um, more helpfully understood by many people through other languages. So I think that would be one place where there would be a friendly um, audience, um, people who are already at dis-ease with um, sort of the dogmatism of the dominant model and are looking for um, alternatives. Um, certainly that's one place where the, the, there's a groundswell of people that are organizing around their dissatisfaction with psychiatry as usual. Yeah, all yeah. right. Well, thank you so much. We're going to have to stop the Q&A now, but Beverly, thank you so much for coming on camera and asking that question. Thank you. Yes. All right. So Katrina, you're going to close it up for us today. Yeah, this has been a really rich conversation. Um, it's been wonderful to have so many people participating and it just goes to show this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many conversations that can be had within this larger conversation uh, just about the topic of building therapeutic trust. Uh, so I think we're, we're off to a good start. I hope that this conversation today is inspiring um, new conversations moving forward and new connections and new ideas. And, you know, I think it's very much about bringing this into the mainstream so that this doesn't need to be a movement that's isolated, that is anti-anything, but it's about just broadening our lenses and opening up and include, you know, being more inclusive of um, what every individual's unique experience is and how to work with that to support all of us moving toward our highest potentials. I think that's really what these experiences are showing up for us uh, as catalysts to help us open up to, to grow and to evolve. Um, so thank you all for being with us today. Um, I want to point out <coughs> we have on our assist website, which is aciste.org, we have a cultural competencies document that is available for download. And I think it's a great tool for learning more about the challenges that experiences are facing and how we can offer practical support, um, whether that's something you use personally for yourself or provide uh, for your your therapist, if you're an experiencer, or as a clinician, something you wrote. Um, I think it's a really great resource uh, that you can download for free. Uh, and also sign up for our newsletter. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out, and we have um, various guest uh, writers come, coming and speaking about their research and their uh, experiences. And uh, we have our registration opening up today. Uh, we just uh, created our link, and that's ready to go for our October conference uh, in Chicago. It'll be October 4th through 6th, and we're gonna have, we have a really great lineup of speakers, and our registration will be open for the first 10 registrants um, for the super early word discount of $3.99. So if that appeals to you and you'd like to save a little money, uh, join us and uh, be in Chicago with us early October. 
And uh, after that, it goes up to 425 until June 20th for the early bird. So um, we'd love to see you there. We'll also be offering trainings uh, for our mental health professionals, our life coaches, and our spiritual directors, where we talk about how to incorporate what we've been learning here today into your specific field. So um, if that's something that interests you, uh, register, join us in Chicago, and uh, we look forward to building community as we go along. So thanks again to our panelists for being with us. And Thank you all so much. We will have our next community conversation in July, July 26th at 1 o'clock uh, Eastern. And we're going to be doing these quarterly. So put it on your calendar. And <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you uh, for all of our attendees that signed in today. And you'll be able to see this on YouTube or on our Facebook page or on our website once we get it up there. So thanks all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.